So as you open up your Bibles today, we are going to be in the book of 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. There you go. You can also follow along uh, ColumbiaGrove.org uh, message notes, or if you go to our homepage, you'd swipe uh, about one box right, you'll get right there. And there's also paper copies of the sermon notes if you would like that. Just put up your pretty little hand and one of our ushers will get one of those paper copies to you as well. See, some pretty hands are going up, so ushers, this is your cue. This is your cue to get some paper around to people. Thank you, uh, ushers. Anyway, something, something is good is going to happen there. But follow along there because this is the, the final week in our series on David. I kind of wish we had a little bit more time. But see, at this point in the story, David is wildly successful. He is powerful. And there's a problem that comes with power. And there's an advantage obviously, but with power also comes pressure. With power comes some isolation. Now, David, he knew what it was like to fight a giant on a battlefield, but he was ill-equipped to fight the giants that lived in his own soul. David was well-equipped to outrun the assassin, King Saul, who was for 15 years pursuing him and trying to take his life, but he hadn't trained hardly at all against the assassin that lives inside every single one of us, that looks to bring us down. And so poor King David, even though he was a very skilled soldier and a very wise politician, he was ill-equipped. He was ill-equipped in the battlefield of the heart. Now, one of the reasons why we need to look at this story is that every single one of us faces some of those same internal struggles and those same internal challenges, which is why I want you to imagine a scene for me. So the, the story today is going to be happening on, in a palace in Jerusalem. So if you can imagine a, like a, a, a palace, and this is, yeah, thank you. You can do some of that. Um, a, a palace in Jerusalem where you are part of the help. You are one of those palace attendants, you know, one of those folks that um, in, in places like that, so like, a, like in a, a hotel or you could imagine a palace, is highly trusted, but for the most part, goes unnoticed. You are a palace attendant to David. Now it's springtime, and it's the time of year where where nations uh, start, to, uh, start to mobilize their armies. And this spring is no different. Uh, this year, uh, the Ammonites are starting to press against the Israelite borders. And so the army of Israel gets dispatched to start to address the Ammonite threat. But the, there's one thing different this year. This year, David stays home. Maybe he's tired. Maybe he's resting Maybe he's paid his dues and this is just another year. This is just another, just another battle. But David stays home. It's mid-afternoon. He's just taken a nice afternoon siesta. Maybe like some of you are going to do this afternoon. I sure hope you do. He takes a nice afternoon nap. Oh, it feels so good. And he gets up and he's walking along the walls of the palace. And as he does, he sees something. More particularly, he sees someone. There's a woman just over there. And she's bathing. And she's beautiful. Now, you see, this is, this is the moment. This is the moment where David, he didn't realize it in the moment, but this is the moment where his future was about to radically change. Because, you see, this is the moment that every single one of us faces on some level or another. This is the moment of testing. This is the moment of temptation. This is the moment where you make the decision between, is this going to be just a passing glance? Oh, look at that. Or is this going to be a lingering gaze? Oh, look at that. David was well-equipped on the battlefield. He knew what to do when he was faced with an external threat, but he did not know what to do 
when he was faced with this kind of a threat. You see, a good moral soldier at this moment in time, they know they've trained their mind just as much as a soldier has trained himself or herself to draw the weapon against the enemy. Almost instinctively, the good moral soldier knows that that moment, that moment of testing, that moment of temptation, that's where you, that's where you engage the weapons of the mind. You change how you think. You, start to, you, you say, I will not objectify this person. You say to yourself, I wonder whose daughter she is. I wonder whose mother she is or whose mother she will become. I wonder whose grandmother she will be one day. I think about her attribute or virtues rather than her attributes. A girl, moral soldier, knows what to do in that moment because it starts to slow the, the release of the chemicals in the brain. You know, these natural desires that can easily turn into temptation, that can easily turn into lust. It starts to slow the chemicals in the brain that otherwise clouds our thinking. But David didn't know. He was defenseless. He hadn't trained for this kind of battle. And so David, in a passing glance... Notices the woman, but the passing glance doesn't pass. It remains and it becomes a lingering gaze. And the gaze becomes a fixation. And the fixation becomes a plan. Who is that? He asks. And so he dispatches you, his attendant, to go find out. This is over in the officer's quarters right next to the palace, so it's pretty easy to figure it out. You make some inquiries. You come back and you say, Your Majesty, her name is Bathsheba. She is the daughter of Elam. She is the wife of Uriah the Hittite. The daughter of Elam, the wife. This should be a clue for King David, but he doesn't pick up on it. He doesn't even pick up on the fact that Uriah, the Hittite, this is one of his most trusted soldiers. This is one of his 300. This is someone that has been journeying with him for more than a decade, that has preserved his life and is in part responsible for why he's even the king in this moment. But see, David, David has been unguarded. He hasn't learned how to fight the battle of the mind. And he's let his guard down. And the passing glance has become a lingering gaze. And the lingering gaze has become a fixation. And the fixation has become a plan. And so David tells you, go get her. Now, you, you know how this works, you see. Is, uh, see, in, in Middle Eastern kings, people of power, I mean, the, the way that it works for, for most kings is... You know, it, Kings get what they want. And see, David, unfortunately, he was a product of his culture, just like sometimes we are a product of ours. A culture that would, that would at the time, and it's horrible to put it this way and even think about it this way, but they would look at women, like, they're, like, they're like Pokemon cards. You know, collect all you can. Collect them all. And, and, if, you can, and if, you can, if you can afford it, if you have the power, if you have the desire, if you have the capacity, you should have it. And so David has been living this way for many years. Oh, this moment is many, many, many years in the making. A sinful worldview that would view sex as a commodity to be enjoyed or a right to be exercised. You ever heard of that? Rather than human sexuality as a sacred gift to be treasured and at times guarded. David was just thinking like the world around him. And so David gave you his orders. And I mean, who dares say no to a king, right? So you journey down to the officer's quarters. You call on Bathsheba and you ask her to come. And she comes. I mean, who dares to say no to a king? You lead her up into the king's chambers. You open the door. You usher her in. Sometime later, 
you usher her out. Who dares say no to a king? And life goes on until a few weeks later where she comes back and she, she finds you and says, I need you to give this message to King David. And you say, what is it, Bathsheba? And she leans in and whispers in your ear, I'm pregnant. You knock on the door of the king's chamber. He asks you to come in. You come in. What is it, he says. You say, well, I was just talking to Bathsheba. You remember her, right? She tells me that she's pregnant. And you see as the king gets very quiet, he's thinking. Hmm. He gives you instructions. You send a message to my general Joab. He's out fighting the Ammonites right now. You send a message to Joab to send Uriah the Hittite here. Send him to me to give report. Off you go. You, you instruct the messenger off to the front lines. And the next day, Uriah the Hittite, he comes back as requested as a good soldier might do. You usher Uriah the Hittite into the king's chambers and the, the, the king addresses him, Uriah, thank you for coming from the front lines. I need to ask you, how, how is my general Joab? How, how are the soldiers? How, how is the war? Uriah says, well, General Joab, he, he, he's doing good. And the soldiers, they're, they're doing good. And the war is, it, it's, it's, doing, it's doing good. Good, good, says King David. Good, good. Thank you for giving that report. Why don't you uh, go home and wash your feet before you head back to the, uh, to the, before head back to the front lines tomorrow? And so you, you usher Uriah out, but Uriah doesn't go home. He, he goes where any deployed soldier would go while the battle is still on. He goes and he spends a night in the servants' quarters. Who says no to a king? Well, apparently Uriah. The next morning, King David asks, so did Uriah, he asks you, so did Uriah, did he go home last night like, he was, like I gave him permission to? And said, no. Uh, no, no, King David. He, uh, he, he stayed in the, in the servants' quarters at the, the entrance to the palace. King David looked a little flustered. Bring Uriah here, please. Or Uriah is ushered into the room. Uriah, King David says, why didn't you go home? And Uriah said to David, said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my commander Joab and the Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go home to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, King David, I will not do such a thing. Then David said, stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. And so King David gives you instructions to bring Uriah to his table that night to keep the wine flowing, keep the most potent wine, keep the best wine in front of him. And so you do. You give him all the wine he can stand. And by late in the night, Uriah's kind of tipsy. And so you lead him back. Let's take you home, Uriah. Let's take you home. But Uriah, he may be tipsy on his feet, but his mind is still crisp enough to know that no good soldier goes home while the army is still deployed. And so he stumbles, rather than back home, he stumbles back to the palace. He stumbles back to the servants' quarters. He stumbles back to where all the enlisted men on deployment sleep. The next day, you have the same instructions. Take him to the king's table, fill him with liquor. And then send him home. 
You put the choice wine in front of him. You do everything you can. By the end of the night, of course, he's tipsy. He doesn't quite know where he's going. You go, Uriah, let's get you home. Bathsheba's probably waiting for you, Uriah. But Uriah, even in his state, he still has the good sense to do the honorable thing. He, uh, he goes back to the servant's quarters. He sleeps with the other palace servants and enlisted men. Hmm. The next morning, King David learns about this. And, and you, come into the, you come into his chambers and you see him just finishing up a letter. You see him write these words down on a piece of paper. Put Uriah, a, a message he's writing to his general Joab. Put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. He seals the letter. He hands it to you. He says, take this to Uriah. Tell him it's a private message for the general. Tell him to take it back to the front lines as he returns. You hold that letter in your hand. As you walk to the servant's quarters, as you see Uriah standing there, ready to return to the front lines, you hand him the message. Uriah, this is a private message for General Joab. It's for his eyes only. Take it to him. You can't even make eye contact with him. Because you know, you know that, that this, this is a death sentence. Now, Joab, he's a fairly ruthless general, and so as Uriah returns back to the front lines, he, he, he follows the instructions to a T. He, he, he intentionally makes a bad strategic decision, and he deploys some soldiers right up to the edge of a city where they are an easy, easy target for the enemy. Next day, a messenger comes back with the, with, with the sad news of, of, of several men being killed, including Uriah. You usher the messenger into David's, David's private chambers. The messenger gives the bad news. And even as the messenger is expecting to be chastised, David responds all too calmly as he tells the messenger, say this to Joab, don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. And the messenger, the messenger returns. And you're dispatched to Uriah's household to deliver the news to Bathsheba. Can you imagine that moment as you knock on the door of the house? As you tell Uriah's family, Uriah's children, and Uriah's wife that Uriah has, has, has been killed in battle, knowing what you know. Bathsheba responds in the, perhaps the appropriate way. She's distraught. She puts on mourning clothes, and for the next 30 days, the period of mourning, she is the widow around town. But at the end of the 30 days, she returns to the palace. She marries King David, and she joins the harem. She becomes a queen. And for the most part, this is the sad reality of it. No one knows. No one notices. Who would dare say no to the king? But you know. And more importantly, God knows. And his life returns to normal, and it seems like everything is going on and going, going back to the way things had been. A few days later, the prophet Nathan 
comes. You usher the prophet Nathan into David's private chambers, and, D- and Nathan has a very, very different message. When Nathan came to David, he said, There were two men in a certain town. One of them was rich and the other poor. The rich man had a large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised that ewe lamb. It grew up with him and his children. It shared his food. It drank from his cup. It even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man. But the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took that little ewe lamb from the rich man. Thank you. (laughs) Well, thank you. That, that, That really would change the story, wouldn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who came to him. Now, David, hearing this story, he burned with anger against the man. And he, and he said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. And then Nathan said to David, David, you are that man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you. I gave your master's wives to you. I gave all Israel and Judah to you. And if that had, not, if that had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why do you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You, David, you struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and you took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household I'm going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you. He will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, David. But I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. And David had a moment of truth. And he said, I have sinned against the Lord. Now, there's a reason why we need to be reminded of stories like this as gross as they are. It's because David's struggle is our struggle too. You might be successful. You might be wise. You might be rich. But it reminds us that that what's done in secret still matters. It reminds us that character still counts. Whether you're a king, whether you're a janitor, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a president, character still counts. And it reminds us that the sins that we keep secret have a tendency to overtake our lives. I want to introduce you to a phrase. It's a little metaphor. I hope it's helpful. It's simply this, that secret sins snowball. Will you say that with me? Secret sins. Sins snowball. You hear the S? S. Because secret sins, they snowball like a snowball rolling down a hill. They tend to get weightier. They tend to get heavier. They have to have greater and greater impact. The sins that we keep hidden in our life, the compromises we keep hidden in our life, they tend to snowball. They tend to get bigger. They tend to have greater and greater and greater impact. And we're reminded that just like David, sadly became a product of his culture and he let the, 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 some of the most intimate areas of his life go unguarded. We're reminded that we face that very same struggle today, perhaps as great or maybe even greater than King David.
the unexpected image return on a Google search. The missing button. The inappropriate angle. The shirt that's just a little bit too tight. It is so easy. It is so easy. For what could be a passing glance to become a lingering gaze. Nobody, you know, clicks on the, you know, on the clickbait at the bottom of a, of a news article, you know, thinking that they're going to be led into the porn industry, but it happens. And nobody who's indulged in porn, and if, and if we're just being honest here, if, if, if our church is statistically like, you know, the average church in America, 50% of you guys in the last month, have you viewed porn? And 25% of women... You viewed porn. I hope, we're, I hope I'm wrong on that. And, and as you indulge in, in that, as you give in to that temptation, as that natural desire turns from the passing glance into the lingering gaze, into the fixation, into the plan, into sin, you'd never think that, that this... this passing glance would lead to adultery. You'd never think this passing glance would lead to murder. We don't intentionally support human trafficking around the world, and yet if you have viewed porn, you need to know this. I mean, porn is one of the leading drivers of human trafficking. Don't tell me that you oppose slavery if you are financially supporting it. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Secret sins, they snowball. They can have an impact like we could never imagine. When we let our hearts go unguarded, when we fail to train our minds like we are called to, like a soldier is called to train his or her body, when we fail to train our minds, secret sins, they snowball. But there is good news. I want to introduce you to one other phrase that I hope will also be helpful. Because just like secret sin snowball, you need to know this, church. You need to know that the sun melts snowballs. Can I get an amen? The sun melts snowballs. You see, secret sins, when they come into the light, when they come into the light of truth, when they come into the light of the, of the relentless grace and love of God, you know that when Jesus died on the cross for your sins, he died on, your, on the cross for your hidden sins as well. You know that, right? You know that? I hope you do. He was the atoning sacrifice for all sins. He was the one who made wrong things right, who was in the process of making bad things better. And as we, we, we confess our sin to him, just like a snowball in the, in the blaze of sunlight gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the sins that bind you and me, especially the secret sins, the ones that, that grow on their own, those secret sins, <laughs> 